I'm president of Atlantic Media, and I've got the great pleasure of working for David Bradley, the, the chairman and owner of Atlantic Media, who's sitting right here. Being asked to fill in for David Bradley at the opening of the Aspen Ideas Festival is a little bit like being asked to fill in on the trumpet for the angel Gabriel. <laughs> and I say that both because it's true, and I figure a statement like that can't be that bad for my job security. I also realize that my presence here denies you what has become a hot ticket in recent years, the annual rap battle poetry slam that was the David Bradley, Walter Isaacson show. But you see, that's actually the point. David and Walter had each, in their own fashion, become the Lady Gagas of the Aspen Ideas Festival. <laughs> and before you start imagining how this might hold true, I'll tell you what I mean. Short of a way too revealing outfit or some force of form of torso-based pyrotechnics, there was simply no longer any way that they could top themselves. So I was called in to de-escalate. But let's be honest, my presence here, my words and delivery will only serve as a pale reminder of how good they once were. <laughs> a few years ago, David Bradley declared in his opening remarks that ideas are infinite. Well, this week, it is our collective responsibility to prove that statement correct, because our challenges are greater and more varied than ever before. And I have no doubt that this audience here is up to that task, because Gathered here is an assemblage of talent unequaled, except perhaps when Walter and David dined together. Walter is indeed quite the polymath. For example, as many of you know, he's been recently hard at work on a biography of Steve Jobs. But what is less well known is that while this is Walter's first foray into the world of Apple as a writer, he's actually been involved in the past with the company as a programmer. About a year ago, Walter created an iPad app that allows its user to write award-winning biographies at the rate of three per year. <laughs> will this render David McCullough and, and John Meacham obsolete? Time will only tell. Walter, we do not know how you find the time to sleep, let alone the time to be such a great partner to Atlantic Media. All, for all of us are so grateful for that. I'd also like to take a moment quickly to thank an important group of people who really make the Aspen Ideas Festival possible, and that is our sponsors. And I'll read them here. They are U.S. Trust, Bank of America, Private Wealth Management, Thomson Reuters, Siemens, Shell, Mercedes-Benz, HP, Ernst & Young, Booz Allen Hamilton, Boeing, Altria, and Allstate. I'm also aware that we have the founders of Twitter here this week, or maybe even here today, and that our in-depth conversations take place against the backdrop of a world increasingly communicating in 140 character bursts, or occasionally in pictures, which apparently are worth a thousand words of apology or one seat in Congress. <laughs> but 140 characters, I mean, that's okay if you're really, really verbose. Before I joined The Atlantic, I helped start a magazine called The Week where our mission was to distill very complex ideas and stories down to their core essence. So I thought I'd take on a personal challenge here today and walk you through the biggest ideas in the world right now in a lot less than 140 characters. That's right, I'm gonna do each idea in only 17 syllables. In that ancient form of Twitter, the art of the Japanese haiku. Are you ready? Chinese bloom or frost? Which will the red groundhog see? Ni hao, Mr. Xi. <laughs> Downturn or bubble? Economy confusing as a CDO. Institutions fail. Global systems under strain. And no DSK. Unreliable and soon unavoidable. See the future cloud. <laughs> Poor warming globe, prevention time now long past, cry, adapt, or flee. And finally, U.S. politics in eight words, jobs, 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 jobs. All of these issues and many more, and many that derive from them, will, will be discussed across the next week. 
which leads me to my final point before I yield the stage, which is the importance of gathering places such as this one to the sharing of ideas. Steven Johnson, who wrote the book Where Good Ideas Come From, makes the argument that a good idea is rarely the product of a single eureka moment, but rather comes from networks of interactions. He described these, and I'm quoting here, places where ideas can have sex. Here in Aspen this week, I hope you're ready, because ideas will find their conjugal beds in tracks and breakout sessions in Pepke and Dorhoser halls, in the meadows at lunch and breakfast. We'll even do it under the music tent. But the point is that magical things happen when in the places where one person's insight can move, challenge, bolster, inspire, chip away at, or strengthen another person's perspective. The, Atla the Atlantic, in fact, traces its own founding to one such place. In 1857, our nation lived under the gathering clouds of secession. We were dealing with an unprecedented wave of immigration and marching forward on a westward expansion. Against that backdrop, a group of men that included Ralph Waldo Emerson, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow met at Boston's Parker House Hotel to grapple with something they called the American idea. The Aspen Institute, just under a century later, shares a similar Genesis story when Chicago businessman Walter Pepke envisioned this place here as an ideal gathering spot for thinkers, leaders, musicians, and artists to contemplate the values of a society in transition. So today and the rest of this week, all of you become the inheritors of these dual traditions. And so as I welcome you, I ask you to put forth your ideas smash them together like atoms against the ideas of others and see what is created. Because in the process, you'll do a lot more than rock David and Walter's world. You'll improve ours. Thank you, have a good week, and now, welcome to the stage, Walter Isaacson. Thank you for uh, not very successfully de-escalating things. I will say halfway through, I was sitting with Jane Harmon, she leaned over and said, what happened to David Bradley? <laughs> David is here and he will be opening on Thursday at our music tent, so we're waiting for that. I've never been compared to Lady Gaga, but certainly I know David hasn't either, so thank you for doing it. It's been seven years since we did this, and let me say what a great partner The Atlantic is. We started this together, we conceived this together, and we did it because The Atlantic uh, Media Company and The Atlantic Monthly is a place that truly understands the joy of ideas. And I say the joy of ideas because when we started the Aspen Ideas Festival, there are a couple of people and my trustees or people involved with the Institute who came and said, Ideas Festival? That doesn't sound right. Festival's not serious enough of a word. Uh, it uh, seems to be too ethereal, you know, y y you should have something more serious uh, than that. And that's not exactly true. I mean, festival comes from the word feast, and what we need sometimes is a feast of ideas. And we need to realize that ideas, just like a jazz festival, just like a food and wine festival, that ideas can bring joy, they can bring excitement, that you can bring them together. The other thing about festivals, the notion of a feast day, it started maybe 3,000 years ago when festivals were created, and it was to bring different tribes together, tribes that often fought, and they would have a great feast day together, and they would learn that they shared certain values and certain ideas. That, too, is what we try to do here at Ideas Festival. The Atlantic Monthly, as our partner, has for the past few years done a great uh, magazine uh, each year that features the ideas issue. We like to think that in various venues now, from Twitter to the magazine to here on stage, we can celebrate ideas. And you'll be hearing in a moment from some of the people who wrote for that issue, as well as from some others. But before we do that, let me just get the Bezos scholars. There's some, uh, besides all of us people who you know, can come to Aspen, we really do, and we appreciate the Bezos family and all the people who have been patrons to bring scholars. We have scholars from around the country, high schools around the country, I think uh, a group of them from Africa, too. If the, the Bezos scholars and other scholars could stand up and appreciate it. Where are y'all? There. Thank you. Thank, there you are. And Jackie and Mike Bezos. Where are Jackie and Mike? The Bezoses? Are, all right. 
Uh, as I said, we're going to hear from a series of people who have uh, been involved with just what is their big idea. It's my great pleasure to kick it off by introducing somebody I've never met before, but I feel as if I know him. Because so often, I go to the web and I don't understand something, I want to learn something, and it's Sal Khan whose voice is there teaching me with that wonderful little board describing things. Whether it's the expansion of the universe or some how uh, you get the fundamental uh, principle of calculus and start with that, or anything now around the world, it is beautiful lessons on the web. It's going to be the way we learn in the 21st century, and it's close to my heart, if I may say so, uh, Mr. Khan, because I think, from what I've read, you did it because in my hometown, New Orleans, when Katrina knocked out the high schools and we were trying to put them back together, you had a niece or a nephew there. You're from there, but your niece and nephew were still there, right? And so you started trying to help them through school, and you did it by providing your little lesson. So let's start off with Sal Khan. So, so right now, if you were to go to a, any university and you were to ask them, what are you charging this $30,000, $40,000 a year for, this tuition that grows by 6% a year, what are you charging it for? They'll say, a learning experience. Look at our facilities. Look at our fa faculty. But if you ask the same question to the students, to the parents, you'll get a slightly different answer. And it's kind of bizarre because a lot of money is changing hands here. They'll say, oh, that's nice, the education experience, the faculty, and all of that. But what we're really paying for is a credential. We're, we view this as a necessary, it's not a, it's not a luxury. This is a gatekeeper to a real career. And if you go to employers, they can sometimes be even a little bit more cynical about it. They'll tell you that they really don't expect, many employers will tell you this, they don't really expect graduates to really know much anything when they, when they show up with their resume. And they just use it as an initial screen on, on the hundreds of resumes they get. And the sad thing about that is that it's actually unfair, too. Because I could go to my local regional university or community college, and I could learn something super deep, learn it as well as anyone at the best universities, but my resume will still be looked over by the guy who kind of drifted his way through Harvard. <laughs> and so my big idea is instead of spending tens of billions of dollars trying to get more and more people through this, take on more and more debt, debt that's not cancelable by bankruptcy, instead of that, let's create an independent assessment and credentialing system. Get nationally recognized institutions, maybe the Aspen Institute, maybe existing, maybe the Harvards or MITs of the world, to allow someone who learns something on their own through work, through the internet, or through a traditional university or community college to prove it. And if you do that, all of a sudden that displaced auto worker, that, that person who was fiddling with computers all of his life or her life, can now train themselves. And once they become as good as the best graduates from the four-year university, they can prove it and they won't, their, their resumes won't be overlooked just because they're 45 years old. And I think if you do this, something very interesting will happen. First of all, the universities will then be able to focus on exactly what they're charging for, educating students. The other things that will happen is now it'll be up to the learner to decide how they learn best. Some may choose to still go spend four years and take on debt, but many others could learn from the internet, they could learn on the job, they could learn from a mentor. And I suspect if we did this, then all of a sudden tuition will start to go down 6% a year. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm the second in the pearl necklace of ideas of tonight. My name is Paola Antonelli. I work at the Museum of Modern Art, and I'm a curator of architecture and design. My passion and my mission in life is to make people understand that design is the most important thing that there is. And, well, we all have our little manias. Uh, in the Aspen Meadows, there are some quotations that are hanging on trees, and there's one by William Burroughs that says that science seeks to understand the universe, and art seeks to enjoy it. And I thought, oh, how cute, and how old-fashioned. You know, enough with this division between church and state. And the funny thing is that art and science have already understood it a long time ago, and they walk hand in hand. Even here in Aspen, you'll hear from John Maida who has not understood it yet, 
are policymakers and economists and the people that run the so-called, I never understand if it's the left or the right side of the brain, you know, I don't even care to learn, but you know, the other side of the brain. So my idea, not so big, but just, you know, big enough to you is this. Let's start treating museum as museums as the R&D departments of society. Let's start injecting more whatever side of the brain it is thinking into the other side. And I'm not saying it from the usual complainy, whiny side of artists and museums. No, I'm asking you to actually make artists uncomfortable. Let's create a bring your artist to work day in which artists all of a sudden are thrown into a boardroom and asked to make decisions that they might have never grappled with. I think that this kind of displacement, which is so vital and necessary for the world at large, might really do us all very good. We're starting to see it, and we'll see it even more in the future. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Oh, let's try that again. It's far too beautiful a setting. Good afternoon. <laughs> My big idea is actually about shortened sentences, very short sentences, sentences that only have six words. I wrote a book this year about race in America and race in my family, and I knew when I went out in the world to talk about this book, I wanted to start a conversation which meant I would be talking to Americans about race. And I sensed that race was something that people don't always like to talk about. And so to lubricate that conversation, I decided to play the race card, to literally play the race card to create a card called the race card, where I ask people to think about their experiences, their thoughts, their observations, their hopes, their dreams, their laments, their triumphs, and then share those things in one sentence, but that sentence could only have six words. Initially, I printed up a couple of hundred of these, and I left them wherever I went to talk, and I was surprised at how many came back. In the first yield, more than half of them came back. So then I printed hundreds more, and now I've printed thousands, and I've got thousands back from all over the world. Thanks to Twitter and Facebook, they've come from places like Abu Dhabi and Brisbane, Osaka, Puerto Rico, all over this country. And what I realized is that people are willing to say amazing things if you allow them to do it in just one sentence, and if they only have to do it in six words. And I'll give you a few examples. Some are poignant. My great-great-grandfather owned slaves. That came from a woman in New York. A young man who goes to school in West Virginia said, stereotype is a shackle. I broke mine. His name is Kwame. My constant companion, good, bad, unrelenting. That's my fellow in Mississippi. Some are edgy. Would Martin Luther King support gay rights? That's from Kevin Danaher. Another woman named Patricia Hawley wrote, diversity doesn't count if it's white. She says, no minority perks for me because my skin is too pale and my last name is not Garcia. Some are hopeful. Start with kids and mix well. I have dozens that say only one race, the human race. Born colored, kids African American, progress, asked Leroy Jones. Some are funny. Not a race you can win. <laughs> Deb Bensky of Iowa City says this, we don't match, yes, we're a family. She's in an interracial family and she often gets quizzical looks and she says that should be her t-shirt model. In fact, she wrote to tell me that that will be her t-shirt model. She's having them printed before the Iowa State Fair. And all 13 members of her family will be wearing that. Some of these six words have such a deep gravitational pull that they pull you into a bigger story. And I'll leave you with the last one, which was given to me by a man in North Carolina. He didn't want to give me his name. His six words were race is throwing rocks at kids. And he says wherever he goes, in Raleigh, the town that he lives in, whenever he meets someone of color, he looks at their forehead. He's 70 years old, you see, and when he was younger, he was very much against integration, and he and the young toughs in town threw rocks and bricks at students as they were crossing the color line, and he knows that some of them made contact. So after all these years, every time he goes to the store, to the library, to the mall, if he sees a person of color of similar age, he looks at their forehead for a scar, but after all these years, also for an opportunity to say, I'm sorry. I learned in this little six word episode, this experiment, that it's not that people don't want to talk about race, but sometimes we just don't listen. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm James Fallows from The Atlantic Magazine. Happy to follow Michelle Norris of NPR. My big idea is a bonus idea, or at least it's a different idea from what I presented in the current ideas issue of the, our magazine. I stand behind that idea, which is that the next war will be digitized, and I explain in the magazine why it should be considered an idea and not a mere downer comment. Some misfortunes and threats to national well-being are strictly that, misfortunes, unpreventable and no one's fault. The lament about Mexico's fate attributed to Porfirio Diaz, so far from God and so close to the United States, describes a misfortune. So too with Poland's unlucky placement in the flatlands between Russia and Germany. The more interesting threatening tragedies are, of course, the vulnerabilities that arise directly from strengths. The open, absorptive, unmonitored nature of Western societies is their, our, greatest long-term asset, but it's been considered our vulnerability during the age of terrorist attacks and the resulting great fearfulness. Exactly the same tension applies to the version of society now being created in the internet cloud. The borderless, omni-accessible, unsheriffed availability of the cloud is why it is so valuable and so constantly under attack. This big idea winds up with a challenge that we do a better job of preserving an open system's virtues while dealing with threats in this virtual world than we have done in the material world. And now here is the bonus idea, which I add because of several very recent trips outside the country. It is that the American idea has never been more powerful and yet rarely more in need of shoring up. Of course, the American idea has always been our glorious burden. Our ideals reflect humanity's hopes, and our realities reflect its limitations. I cannot remember a time when the country standing in the world was not rocketing wildly up and down, up with the pizzazz of the Kennedys and the moral standing of King, down with their deaths, up and down with all our wars and scandals, up with the booms of the 1980s and the 1990s and the 2000s, and down with all the subsequent busts, up and down with each new political start and each familiar political disappointment. Yet day by day, the actual work of American society, the melding of peoples and the nurturing of ideas and creation of a style soon accepted as local in much of the world has only become more influential. As of the latest rankings, nine of the 10 most recognized and respected brands in the world, 16 of the top 20, were from the United States, a list that starts with Apple, Google, IBM. This is not about consumer gizmos or consumerism. It's about American institution success as arenas in which diverse people collaborate, innovate, dream of products that are seen not as one country's achievement, but of the world's. Our great universities are the world's great learning institutions. The main counterpart organizing idea from China is staggering in material output, but less appealing as a rival vision these past few months than it has been in years. We know our problems, governance, inequality, polarization, stagnation. The big idea is that it's worth addressing them because our system, battered, fractious, unworthy, struggling, and our ideal are appealing in ways they have not been before. My name is Christina Johnson, and to put my idea into context, I have to say that my passion is clean energy and cleaning the environment, and I'm a startup junkie. So therefore, in my spare time, my starting company, I was inspired by this, uh, reading Bob Herbert's last column, Losing Our Way, when he talked about the next generation will be less well off than their elders. And, and though I understood what he was saying, I had to think, how is that measured? Usually it's measured in gross domestic product or, or income per capita, and I thought, well, what does it mean to be less well off? And what do our children need less of, and what do they need more of? So certainly I think we would say they need less war, Having them be one of the generations that's not engaged in war would be a good thing. Less obesity, the ch kids today, 17% are obese, three times the last generation. Less dependence on imported oil. When I was in college and when Kitty was also in college, we were twice less dependent on oil than we are today. So these are some of the things I think about. Less junk food, more exercise, less war, more clean energy. As Bruce Springsteen said, and I guess this is the idea, maybe it's time for us to save up for things that money can't buy. So I wanna share with you my personal philosophy, which is if it's a problem and money can solve it, it's not a problem. So that's what I think that we should be thinking about is how do we 
preserve the environment? How do we provide for energy, more energy security? And as the Dalai Lama said, that the world will be saved if more women are educated. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank Kitty Boone and the Ideas Festival because all the tracks mirror these concepts. They talk about global economics and are we going to be a culture that values the pure discount method of future goods and services or temporal impartiality? Are we gonna think about a world without war through the uh, State of the Union and post 9-11? We're gonna think about how to preserve our environment by hearing from some of the fabulous people in this administration like EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson. And I could go on, but I think it's a brilliant set of ideas and so really I have no idea other than I'm interested to hear of all the little ideas and the big ideas that we'll discuss this week because together I think we can build upon what the kids of the next, ge next generation will need which is respect for themselves and education and respect for those with less stuff. I'm not sure they need more stuff measured by goods. They need more respect and more opportunity to share that with those that have less stuff. So that's the idea. Thank you. I always had this problem. <laughs> I'm Tana Asi Coates. I'm from the Atlantic. Um, every year I come and I watch everybody give their ideas. So I was so excited to get up here and present my own. Thought I'd talk about the debt ceiling off of my brilliant solution for the housing crisis, so a trenchant critique of the Arab Spring. <laughs> but at the last minute, I was instructed to talk about the issue that truly matters for America, the saga of LeBron James. <laughs> so, <laughs> sticking with what matters. Um, my big idea is that uh, players own the game. The central thesis is basically that there's been a shift in popular support uh, in sports away from the people that signed the checks and more towards the people who are on the field. In the past uh, years in the history of sports, whenever anything went wrong in terms of labor, be that a strike or some sort of work stoppage or holdout or contract dispute, it was generally seen as the work of rich, spoiled athletes. And while that's still present, increasingly fans are seeing things from the perspective of players. Consider the current work stoppage in the NFL. I hope we have a lot of football fans here. <laughs> um, if you look at historical precedent, the last time this happened, during 1987, we had a pro football strike. And fans were polled to see who they sided with. And three to one, they went with owners. In the current uh, lockout, 19% of fans blamed the players, but 32% actually blamed the owners. And I think that's actually a good sign because what it shows is that you have a more informed fan base. What you have is a broad stream of media. And for the first time, you have fans who are not only aware of the small actions of players, so the little roller going through Billy Buckner's legs, you have fans who are actually aware of the actions of owners and what they do. And so if you look at Jerry Jones, to my great dismay, as uh, awful management of the salary cap, you have a fan base that's aware of that and how that in impacts the game now. But I think beyond that, there's something else, something larger that spreads throughout this society in this age of Obama. You have a less racist country. In the 1980s, uh, even then, the majority of the athletes in the big leagues, in the NBA, uh, in the NFL, were African American. And there was always this sense that you were looking at this stereotype of loud, boorish, and overpaid athletes who didn't really deserve the salaries that they were getting. But I think we're past the days when you looked at uh, whoever was talented and white and was coming into the NBA league and pronounced them the next Larry Bird. Certainly Bird versus Magic doesn't ring with the same sort of racial connotation that Dirk versus LeBron did. I don't even know if that even came up. So I think what you're looking at is a situation in which, in terms of the labor base, players command much more respect from fans. And I think that has profound implications. And going back to the King, there are obvious exceptions. I think you have to stick within the boundaries of good taste. Every rule has an, an, an uh, exception. No one objects to your right to dump your girlfriend. It's a bad idea to dump your girlfriend on the jumbotron, though, and label it a decision, even if you're doing it for charity. So I think as long as you stay within the boundaries of good taste, players will be OK. Thank you. I have the opposite problem. 
My name is Robin Wright, and I'm a joint fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Woodrow Wilson Center, where I work with the great Jane Harmon. I've been covering the Middle East since I landed uh, in Beirut on October 6, 1973, the day the war, the Fourth Middle East War broke out, and I've covered every war since then, and I can't seem to divorce myself from it. My idea has to do with the next decade in the Islamic world, and I've coined a phrase to describe it. It's the counter-jihad. Muslim societies have begun to move beyond jihadism, not only because of the death of Osama bin Laden, and often despite what the United States did in Iraq and Afghanistan. The counter-jihad is about much more than the Arab uprisings, about the quest for political participation and free speech and assembly. It's also about challenging extremism, and it is for the first time in the latest phase of Islamic activism about seizing control of your own destiny, about being proactive and not just reactive, whether it's the Arab-Israeli dispute or to reaction to a foreign intervention. And it is evident not only in the 22 Arab countries, not only in the 57 Muslim countries, and not only among Muslim minorities, including in the United States. It is evident also in the rap lyrics of the new Muslim hip hop artists who sing songs against extremism. It is evident among the Muslim comedians who tell hilarious and sometimes dirty jokes against bin Laden and other extremist groups. It's evident among the Muslim playwrights who tell, uh, who have wonderful plays they're writing, all with jihad in the title, like Till Jihad Do Us Part, which is, believe it or not, a romantic comedy. <laughs> and it's about redefining, seizing again, the idea of what is jihad, the daily struggle to be a decent human being. It's also reflected in the new martyrdom we have known martyrs for so long as those who are extremists who strap suicide bombs on themselves. The new martyrdom, the critical element in the counter-jihad is the rise of young people who challenge authority, killing themselves in the process to shame regimes, not to try to kill other people. Now, the flip side of this coin, the downside, is what I call the unrequited rebellions. And this is where we get back to what Justin talked about. And it's about jobs, 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 and jobs. The challenge in the region is not just coming up with new constitution and new leaders. It's also about coming up with new social contracts in terms of what governments can provide for their people. And this is the danger, the greatest danger, of where it might fail. And I made it in exactly three minutes. Thank you very much. I'm Clive Crook. I'm a writer with The uh, Atlantic and the Financial Times. I was going to talk about LeBron James, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm having to pivot to the debt ceiling. <laughs> I, I hope that will be OK. Well, the most important question in world economics today is this. How long will global investors be willing to lend to the U.S. at very low interest rates? The U.S. needs to borrow hundreds of billions of dollars a year and will do for years to come, regardless of any deals that Congress might cut on spending and uh, taxes. Uh, if the U.S. were an ordinary country, it would already be having to pay much more than it does uh, for this uh, colossal volume of credit. Luckily, today, the U.S. is not an ordinary country. It is a preeminent economy in the world. It is a massive presence in world trade, financial hub of the global economy, and the dollar is the international reserve currency, which a French statesman once quite, quite rightly called the exorbitant privilege. Now, all these advantages hold down the U.S. cost of borrowing because people want to hold dollars. And in the natural course, and, uh, and that holding down the cost of borrowing, of course, gives a huge economic benefit. Um, and it's made it possible for the government to respond much more forcefully to the recession than would otherwise have been the case. But in the natural course of events, this uh, exorbitant privilege is going to fade. Other countries are growing very fast, Brazil, Russia, India, China. 
Uh, they're challenging over the long term US economic supremacy. Other currencies will eventually rival the dollar. And it really is just a question of time before the exorbitant privilege fades. Now, the most stupid thing the US could do in the meantime would be to accelerate this process by calling the nation's creditworthiness into question. And that, of course, is exactly what Washington is doing in the fight going on right now over the debt ceiling. In effect, we are telling the markets that a, a default on US government debt is actually thinkable. We are setting a new benchmark for fiscal recklessness. Now, I do think a deal will probably be done at the last minute. But the fact that we are even having this conversation is an amazing gamble. If default does happen, perhaps by accident, if the debt ceiling brinkmanship in error takes us beyond the brink, then this will go down in, in history as the greatest unforced error ever made in economic policy, and perhaps the most damaging error ever made in economic policy. So my big idea is this, don't do it. Hello, Aspen. I'm Michelle Martin, uh, and I am the other Michelle at NPR, and I actually don't actually have to see the people I talk to every day, so I'm a little nervous, so <laughs> I wrote down what I'm going to say. Um, my program is a midday program where we focus on the politics, policy, arts, culture, and sports, but from a multicultural perspective. And my big idea is that black folks have not left the building, and that Latinos have not left the building and Asians have not left the building, and white folks have not left the building. Why do I say that? Because we hear a lot about people of color, and we hear a lot about the multiracial experience. I just used that term. We're hearing about the Latino diaspora and how Latinos are the largest minority group in the country. That's all true. We hear a lot about the Asian diaspora and how Asian Americans are the best educated minority group in the country, and that's true. With all that, you'd think that, except for the president and the poor, that all the black people have left, and everybody else, well, they're people of color. And the truth is that people of color, for the most part, still live in their own story, which is to say that they still see themselves as black, Latino, Asian, Mexican American, Chinese, Vietnamese American, Cambodian, European American. And when we use the language of the melting pot, as attractive and as lovely of an ideal as it is, and it does exist, we're missing the true story. And why does this matter? This is not a matter of an existentialist crisis. Those are very interesting. But it really does matter because there really are very different attitudes about what government should be, what we should do, how we should proceed as a country. There really are. And that's not exactly driven by race and class and color, but it is so informed by it that to not notice it and acknowledge it is to really miss it. Here's an example. Those of you who followed education reform in Washington, D.C., you'll know that that was a conflict between people of color. There was a dynamic young reformer, Korean-American, who swooped into town wanting to fix things for the mainly African-American people. But what happened is they said not so much. And the reason that they said not so much is that they saw the schools not just as a vehicle of achievement for the kids, but as a, as a, as a, as a place of employment for predominantly African-American teachers, and that they saw economic stability for those teachers at least as important as the education of those kids. And you can like it or you can not like it, but you cannot ignore it. And I say that we all represent both the promise of this country and its most shameful history, all of our racial trajectories and stories. Did you know that the number of black people with graduate degrees has doubled in this country in the last 10 years? <laughs> Even even as African Americans have become the most incarcerated people in the world. And the fact is that this person of color narrative does represent something beautiful about our desire for this country, a desire to all be one, to be unified. It speaks of a desire for coalition and connection. All of those things matter. But in my view, it's also about wanting to dispense with the old and to come in with the new. And the changing demographics of this country are not the same as changing the paint on the walls in the dining room. And we need to accept that. And while all these stories and narratives are true and are beautiful in their own way, none of those colors has left the building. And we each live in our own story. 
And that's my big idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, with thanks to Kitty and Walter uh, and the Institute, um, I'm Mark Tremo. Um, I run a nonprofit organization that operates at the interface of neuroscience, the arts, and medicine. Um, although some of our research has been interested in the question of innate preferences for the music of Stephanie Germanato and Bruce Springsteen, Stephanie's Lady Gaga, and Ludwig uh, Beethoven, over the past five years, uh, my colleagues and I at Harvard and Mass General uh, have been working on the question of innate preferences. And in the course of this work, um, have become very interested in the plight of the newborn. How many of you were born or have first degree relatives who have premature, who had premature infants? Okay, so over the next decade, we're going to have about uh, one and a half billion new members of the human race around the world. And about five million of them per year will be born in the United States. Increasingly over the past several decades, we've suffered a remarkable increase in the number of premature births and with them the complications. One in eight babies now born in the United States will be born significantly premature or with low birth weight. Of those babies, one in three will have learning disabilities, one in three will have attention deficit disorder, and the risk for autism will be increased by 86%. As part of our research and development of new technologies in healthcare and in um, neuroscience and in medicine, we've uh, developed the idea of building an artificial womb. Many of you are familiar with incubators and premature infants going into incubators soon after birth. I can tell you as a neurologist and as a physician, they're wonderful for the heart and lungs. They're wonderful for the skin. They do nothing for the brain. Uh, we have um, an interest in partnering with individuals from uh, technology industries to develop the kind of incubator artificial womb that will provide the nourishment and the enrichment of the sensory environment for the brain in these premature infants and sick infants that we've been doing for the past 50 years for, the heart, for their hearts and lungs. I'll be in the Music on the Edge session. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Rosen, and I'm a writer for The Atlantic. And I'm going to appeal to the frustrated parent in many of you, although not by writing a children's book with the F word in the title. I wish I had had that idea. Um, <laughs> this is a vision of humiliation in the United States. You are in your mid-20s, so you're not a few months out of college. You're more like a few years out of college. And you're living in the basement, which has more or less become your permanent home. And you crawl out of the basement just in time to see your mother in the kitchen getting ready to go to work. And you say to your mother, uh, did you buy my favorite Pop-Tarts by any chance? And she says, no, I'm really busy. I have to go to work. Can you just buy them yourself? And then you say, um, can you loan me $5? So the point is that in other countries, uh, people value filial duty and sticking around the familial home, but in America, we value independence. Uh, you're supposed to, after you graduate from college, leave the house. Uh, you're supposed to pay your own rent. Uh, you're supposed to find a spouse and raise your own children. But lately, that process has gotten blocked. The latest census shows that in the age group 25 to 34, 5.5 million uh, Americans are living with their parents. And here's what's worse, uh, the grandparents are moving in too. Um, <laughs> that actually was not a joke. Um, <laughs> that was serious. Um, there is a new phenomenon in America called the multi-generational household. It now accounts for about 16% of American households, which is by far the highest it's been, almost since the Great Depression, more like since the 1950s. And the children in this situation, uh, many of whom I've talked to, complain about the obvious things if you stop and think about it. How do you invite a date home? You know, it sounds funny, but that's kind of necessary if you're going to get married. You know, how do you, you go into your job interview and it turns out grandpa has stolen your tie. It's just kind of a frustrating situation. Um, now, of course, this is yet another consequence of this recession. 
and the latest string of recessions, which seem to be profoundly altering our culture in permanent ways. Uh, this is a sad result of older people who can't pay their rent, uh, younger people who are having a hard time getting started in life and finding a job. Nonetheless, I am choosing as my big idea to see the silver lining. What is the silver lining? It's this. Uh, the American family is long overdue for a definitional overhaul, long overdue. We've got 40% of children who are now born to single mothers or at least parents who are not married. We've got gay families, adopted families. We've got fertility technology, which makes almost every kind of family possible. So I'm thinking <laughs> we can stop calling on the traditional family as our vision of the American family and change it to something that allows us to include, say, the grandparents in the holiday picture and maybe even some children who are slightly too old to still be eating Pop-Tarts. That's it. I'm David Leonhardt. I'm an economics columnist with the New York Times. Uh, Justice Elena Kagan, the most recent member of the Supreme Court. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the second most recent member of the Supreme Court. Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. Former Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. Some of our most prominent female CEOs. What do these phenomenally, phenomenally successful women have in common? They do not have children. I'm well aware that you can name phenomenally successful men who do not have children. And I'm well aware that you can name phenomenally successful women who do have children. Come September, I will work for one of them, Jill Abramson. But the fact is, is that when you look across society, you see far, a far higher share of successful women who do, know, do not have children than you can say of men. The Supreme Court summarizes this better than any other institution. The last three men to be nominated to the Supreme Court have seven children, albeit not with each other. <laughs> the last three women nominated to the Supreme Court have none. I don't mean to suggest that traditional sexism has been banished. Far from it. It has not. Women still tend to face a significantly tougher road, whether they have children or not, than men do. They have to work harder and do better. But the fact is that we have made enormous progress against traditional sexism. The gap between men and women of similar skills, education, experience, as best as economists can measure it, the pay gap between them is now just a few percentage points, vastly down from what it was. Women outcompete men at every level of our educational system. And yet, only 15 of our Fortune 500 CEOs are women. Once you leave the economist world of controlling for factors like age and experience and you enter the real world, women make 23% less than men. How could this be? My idea is that we haven't made nearly as much progress against momism as we have against sexism. We force people to pay a terrible price for taking time off, for working part-time, for working full-time in many fields, but not working extra time. How can we deal with that? Well, I think there are several ways, but I think the first thing to remember is that this is a problem that becomes worse over time. A recent study of MBAs showed that men and women coming out of MBA programs made roughly the same. 15 years later, men made 75% more. This isn't just a problem among MBAs either. It's a problem in low-paying white-collar work and other things. I think there are policy solutions. Universal daycare, which recognizes that the family isn't what it once was. But I don't think it's just policy. I think it's companies recognizing that there is an enormous pool of untapped and underutilized talent out there in our workforce. It is parents, and it is in particular moms. And it's building career ladders that allow you to work four days a week, or allow you to work seven hours a day, or allow you to work eight hours a day, and not forfeit your opportunity at big future promotions. Call me an optimist, but I would bet if companies created these ladders, some men would sign up for them as well. I know I would. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Melody Barnes, and I am the domestic policy advisor in the White House. And I got here, and I have to be honest, I realized that maybe my big idea was dressing to match the set. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've often wondered if this jacket was a little too festive, but I, I'm feeling better about it. Um, 
but in all seriousness, uh, the current debate in Washington around deficits and debt ceilings and default and cuts in discretionary spending and defense cuts as well illuminate the challenges that we're going to have going forward in investing in areas of big national problems, our big national challenges. Whether you talk about our anti-poverty efforts, whether you're thinking about our food system, dealing with childhood obesity, the slow and elimination of environmental degradation, building ourselves towards an energy economy, a clean energy economy, how we're going to take these on will be increasingly more difficult as we confront these issues and as we go through this current debate. Now the President has said, and we are committed to making those smart investments, but we also know that we will not be able to, nor should we, do this alone. We don't have all the expertise in government. It isn't going to be our core, our core uh, set of assets if we are doing this by ourselves. So, the growth of the impact in economy and impact investing. Impact investing is the harnessing of private capital into profitable businesses and projects that also have social impact. This goes beyond corporate social responsibility, which is a wonderful thing, but often sits inside companies um, alongside their core uh, objectives around profit making, but instead goes to the bottom line, the double and triple bottom line ideas that are starting to proliferate and starting to grow. This isn't a brand new idea, but I think it's nascent in our efforts to try and e to build an economy that actually supports it. And in fact, what we know is from researchers, JP Morgan and the Monitor Group are projecting that just going in the direction we're moving right now, this has the, the uh, impact or has the possibility of being a half trillion dollar um, asset under management sector our, of our economy over the next two, 10 years. But how do we grow it? So again, we're focused on profitability, but we're also focused on social impact. And just this past week, we had the first ever conference at the White House that brought the investment community, brought entrepreneurs, brought foundations and philanthropists, and my colleagues across the government from the Department of Treasury, my colleagues at the National Economic Council, OPIC and elsewhere, together to think about ways to grow this sector of the economy, to find other ways outside of the government, but with government support, to grow these socially and profitably focused businesses. The next task that we have in front of us is thinking about what will be a universal and objective definition of social impact so that investors who don't necessarily have expertise in areas of poverty elimination, who aren't necessarily experts on energy and the energy economy, can also make objective and thoughtful con uh, considerations about the businesses before them. How can we also lower the barriers that government has created so that these kinds of businesses, these double and triple bottom line businesses, can grow and can thrive? We're going to be continuing these efforts. We'll be putting out a report and continuing our work across sectors over the rest of the summer. We've been doing this in conjunction with the Aspen Institute, and we look forward to growing this aspect of the economy to deal with the big challenges facing our country today. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kitty Boone. I run the Aspen yeah. Ideas Festival. <laughs> Walter said it best, um, this is a feastable, and I think that maybe the best idea that I've come up with tonight is actually because we haven't been able to get a trademark on festival that we're now going to call it the Aspen Ideas Feastival, and then well, nobody else can copy us in the country. Um, you have gotten a taste of the feast for the week. We just went through some people that will be speaking to you tomorrow and the next day and the next day, whether it's on the subject of the American economy on the global economy, on green technology, on design and our culture, on education in the 21st century, on music and the brain, on, I've got to think, because we covered a lot of territory. There's two areas that we didn't cover tonight, food and happiness. So one of my goals tonight, before we let, let, let you go, is to tell you where the food is and to hope that you go into this week with a lot of happiness because you will have a wonderful time. Um, we have some things that, that we will explain. We have 300 plus speakers over the course of the week and with that kind of 
volume and plane issues like we had tonight, there will be changes, and I wanted to t tell you quickly how we will announce those changes on a daily basis. If you have a BlackBerry, an Android, an iPad, an iPod, an iPhone, um, we have an app which you can download at AIFestival.org which will tell you your schedule every day. We have a wonderful set of displays from Hewlett Packard which can allow you to personali personalize your schedule which I highly recommend you go touch and do. That will also allow you to update your schedule and, and get changes. And every morning we will also do the unthinkable which someday we'll figure out how not to do which is to hand out um, paper that will explain changes as well. Um, we have need to see my glasses here. We, I think we talked about tweeting early. We encourage you to tweet. The hashtag for that is hashtag Aspen Ideas. Um, and I think one of the things that I really want to leave you with tonight is um, this wonderful set of sponsors we have and what I think a, a major change this year is the um, upgrade in terms of the incredible exhibits that are sitting on our campus, whether it's in the Coke building where you can go test Hewlett Packard uh, um, products and participate in the cloud, or you go over to the Siemens um, Green Cities exhibit and learn about what that company is doing and how we're greening our cities across the globe. That's in what is normally our health center and now is the Siemens exhibit. We have a group of girls from high school who are going to come talk later in the week about the Eco Marathon car that they have built. Shop girls are presenting the Iron Maiden, which is in one exhibit over there. And uh, they're, in, they're 17 years old, and they've won a major national competition. We're really thrilled to have them. Allstate is also bringing us a group of debaters that will debate on the 29th, I believe, in the afternoon from the inner city of Chicago.